right to the rocks. Then I make that shit back. Run up on me, get shot in the back. It's just a bit of here, yeah, Scott Show, man. Back around. Damn, so we got. Pop show back out west once again, and we got. We stay out west. How? Well, is it out west? How U.S. prison gangs in the west our familia actually work? This would be very uh, interesting cool, because we're learning how everything works. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's your first time tuning in, subscribe to the channel, request the content, and then we react. This is the only channel on YouTube that you talk. With us, we have conversations with you. We're not talking at you. We're super stupid interactive. Like, you can get at me on Instagram. Follow him on Instagram. Jeremy TV, Pots React. We have a Discord that's lit. Um, also, if you really like what you see, please share this content with someone else. Let's have a right to right? No more no talk. That's the familiar prison gang. I was a Category 3, and I was a regimental commander in different parts of Northern California. <laughs> And this is how crime works. Oh shit! Ooh. Talk about commander. I'm sorry. I had to laugh at that. Why do you want to be? Why are you? I mean, I don't know if he's proud, but talk about he's a commander of a, of a prison and shit like that. He's proud. Yeah. I heard of this dude, boxer. Really? You I heard, heard of him before. When he was slimmer though, he looked like he had one too many sneakies. <laughs> From parts of Northern California, and this is how he's crime a big works. Boy. I've been to San Quentin, Pelican Bay. In the oh, early shit. 90s, they put us out there with Southern Mexicans and the Aryan Brotherhood, the Nazi lowriders. Wow. Those were our enemies. They were putting us out there on the yard together and we were going oh, out wow. there fighting. If, you know, you were crafty enough to bring a weapon out, we'll try to kill each other. Yo. Chapter one, joining again, a member of the mob. I went to prison in 19, 1988 when I was 18 years old. Damn. You know, some of my older homeboys that were there in, in the county jail with me basically told me that, you know, when, when I get to San Quentin, that the NR is going to approach me mm. about making a commitment. North I knew who to look for. Think so. The first time I went out to the recreation yard, there was a group of individuals that were in the corner that were covered with tattoos. Those were the NR members. From that point on, they put me on a on a 90 day probationary period. It's like you're functioning within that movement. What is but this? You're a not... job? They put you in a 90 day period, probation period where you And it is a job. You know why? Because some of them dudes are lifers. Yeah. They ain't coming true. home. So they do you doing what they say, or you have a major problem. Do you think he counted as two prisoners? Because he's that big? Well, today he would. I don't think he was that big when he was 18. Uh, yeah, right. On a 90 day probationary period. It's like you're functioning within that movement, but you're not an actual member. You can do anything that they ask you to do. Oh, shit. Stabbing somebody, keeping security on somebody, holding paperwork, holding a weapon. A lot of guys that make a commitment because they want the status, they want the title. Those guys are going to end up getting weeded out because they're not making the commitment for the right reasons. They're not true believers. Mm. I was an NR member for about five years, six years. People take notice when you're functioning that long and you're not questioning authority, you're developing into a leader. Eventually, the NF is going to approach oh, you because the NR... So it's called the S Nuestra Raza. So Which what is that? Translation means our race. Yeah. But like, what is... So, also, oh, there's a difference between Ortenio and Nuestra Raza? I don't know. Okay. Not sure. This is like the uh, NF's training grounds. I think it was 1994, I was approached by two high-ranking NF members. Smiley from Salinas and Mike Eo. Well, he named people. Induction process is similar to the NR. You go through an indoctrination process where you learn some of their, their concepts, their bylaws. You have a sponsor and you have the guy that actually pulls you. They're responsible for you. When you make a commitment to the NF, it's a lifetime commitment. Mm -hmm. I was asked things like, are you willing to kill your own flesh and blood? You know, are you willing to put the organization first? before everything else in your life. Everything else that you were loyal to becomes secondary. They write everything down. There's 14 bonds, which is, I used to call it like my little toolbox. Everything that I needed to know how to function within that movement. Conduct, discipline. You're encouraged to study things like Middle Eastern philosophy, oh, wow. Socrates, revolutionary uh, literature like George Jackson, Che Guevara. Mm. And then there's everything that you need to know about how to make weapons. I can make a stabbing instrument out of 15 pieces of paper. What the fuck? It's all about how you roll it and then how you put the point on. When your membership is sanctioned, there's not no big ceremony. They'll get together with you, maybe in a group setting out there on the yard. They'll say something like, um, today, we're, you know, we're welcoming the brother uh, boxer in. Me, I was 
right there in San Quentin on the Bro, yard. Wow, you know, he's he was done big. Similar. That's crazy. Hey, this brother's a carnal now. You know, he's a familiano from this point on. He's a member of the mob. It's like I felt like I reached a pinnacle, a point in my career where I had really accomplished something. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've done, it was all worth it. The first day in jail, chapter two. The bad news was. How many years has I got? When a new arrival will come in, we'll, we'll get his information, we'll get all his vitals, we'll get his vitals. name, his CDC number, we'll get a little bit about his history, we'll get things like his AKA, his age, his, his, his neighborhood, what they called him. We'll look on the BNL to make sure he's not on the BNL. So the BNL, the bad news list is we keep a, a roster of everybody that's coming in and out of that household. I'll send a filter out to all the, the members that are in that household and I'll ask everybody, you know, have you done time with this individual? This guy just drove up, you know, do you know him? Any good or bad information that'll get filtered out. If nothing comes back, he'll be welcome into the household. Then at that point, he'll be given a care package. Uh, soap, shampoo, coffee, toothpaste, things like that. When you first come in to an ad seg or even a main line, they give you what's called a 114 lockup order. That's like your passport. The gangs, they're gonna ask you for that. But the only way you're gonna get a lockup order is if they freely give it up. That's the only way we're gonna get it. It's gonna say on that lockup order, whatever gang that you're affiliated with, it's gonna say things like, if you got an S on your your um, jacket, like a sex offense oh, or something, it's gonna, it's gonna say it right there. So somebody like that, you know- They, they ain't giving it up. You got an S, you're-, you're they probably wouldn't even give up their 114 lockup order because they already know what time it is. If you decline to give up that information, you're done. That's somebody that refused to comply with the program. Somebody like that's not going to be welcome out to the yard. If he tries to come out to the yard, he'll get hit at the gate. Oh, I mean, obviously, there's, wow. there's a lot of perks. Doing dips. He's got stabbed in his face while doing dips. So the yard is where all the bullshit happens, right, guys? Because like in the yard, it makes the most sense. There's still cameras there, but it's more open space. But it doesn't matter because you run with the you gotta run the program. So if they tell you to hit somebody, you hit her. Yeah. All right. I mean, it's hard for us to understand, and probably you as civilians. But this is their life, bro. This is their real world. The gangster prison shit. So with with becoming an, a member like that, you're gonna get that rock star status kind of treatment from a lot of the youngsters out there on the streets. And in prison, they look up to you. They call NF members just like they call Mexican Mafia members big homies. Yeah. Well, you're going to have a lot of, of access at money. I've learned a lot of things that um, that I still hold to this day, even though I'm not a part of it no more. You know, things like conducting myself um, a certain way. Chapter three, this is a fast-ass chapter. Word, the, the structure, structure, the inner council, what the, the fuck? Circle. The NF is built. It's, it's constructed it's funny, I say, Is he proud of this? But sometimes when you go to jail, you have to pick a side. If you don't pick a side, it's pretty much over, right? Especially in the California prison system. So you like you have to pick a side. So I'm saying like, yeah, it's, what, it's just like a job, but like you kind of have to do this. Yeah, yeah. We kind of like, we don't know anything about jail, so we're learning with this. So we're trying to like process everything. Yeah. It, you, you're like, well, I'll go to jail and mind my business. I'm yeah. going to ride solo yeah. and mind my business. And that. It's not going to run like that? No under a paramilitary structure. A lot of the, the old NF members came from the Marines, they're ex-Marines. So they actually took a lot of the, the structure of the leadership in the military and brought it to the NF. You have like captains, lieutenants, commanders, a category one or for members that are just coming into the organization. They have no status over anybody else. Then you have a cat too. They've shown that they have leadership potential and they can give a correct interpretation of the Constitution. They'll become teachers for the Cat 1s. Now, in order to become a Cat 3, this is the cream of the crop. You need to be voted in. Then you have the inner council and the general council that basically make the decisions for the entire organization. You have a general for, for the prisons. You have a general for the streets and then you have a general that's ba it's basically like a internal but these affairs. generals gotta be like people who got life right like the top top those gotta be the life risk because well i'm sure they rotate them you gotta put the people in control who are the people who are gonna be the forever they're gonna be the most invested into this if you put a guy who got five years as a general you're not gonna really logically be. yeah but like maybe if a guy's doing life and he's a little older yeah but they're jailbirds so that's not anything logically that's what yeah, they're there yeah 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 yeah, yeah. well Believe it or not, a lot of prisoners are smart, or they, they become smarter in prison, you know? Yeah, and I think a lot of it is people who think that... Pe 
There's a big error with humans where we think we're too smart and we don't follow the rules, so then we end up in jail. Mm. So we are smart, but we don't listen to common sense sometimes. Yeah. And we do stupid shit. There's a lot of dummies too, though. He handles investigations, um, internal disputes, things like that. When you're in the shoot, you might be in charge of like 200 guys. You're not really running the whole prison. There's guys out there on the main line, regimental commanders out there that are doing that. But on the streets, if you're a regimental commander out there, it might be 20 or 30 guys. I was a regimental commander all over Northern California at different parts. Each time, there was probably around 10 to 20 members that were under me at that time. A day, for me, well, it depends. Like San Quentin, you're running H unit in North Block, West Block. I would have to sit there and answer some investigations, so you're getting daily filters or weekly filters from all these different blocks. All day long, I would just be getting inundated with kites. San Quentin is the worst place to be as far as being a leader. Mm. The rivalries are nervous. The main rivals for the NF are the Mexican Mafia. They're following the Sureños. And then you have the Aryan Brotherhood, and they're following the whites. But on the main line, it's mixed. Everybody's mixed out there. The Northanios, the Sureños, the Blacks, everybody's mixed. If you're talking about in an ad seg type of environment, a shoe program, everybody's kind of segregated. I spent all the 90s in the shoe program. When you see us out there on the yards and we're doing burpees and we're doing mm. exercises out there, we're not out there doing that because we're just trying to get karate bodies and <laughs> just trying to, to look nice, right? We're training for a war. Uh -huh. That's what it is. They're getting ready to go to the shoe programs. They're gonna be engaged in a conflict. So the shoe wow. program is like a prison inside of a prison. They put you in a cell and you stay in the cell about 23 hours a day. You'll come out of the cell you know, for a half hour to take a shower. And then you might come out for yard and you come out to a yard that's, you got four concrete what walls and a camera. That's Shoot. all that's out there. You got plexiglass on the top. If you see a bird fly over, you're like, damn, I seen a bird today, man. You go back in there and tell people in the pod. In the shoe program, they got what's called a nerve system. Everything is, is electric up there in Pelican Bay. They sit up there and they push buttons all day. You know, you got a one cop up there that's in charge of six different wow. pods. So he might forget somebody's in the shower or he might forget that a, a door is open and he'll press another button and somebody else will come out. You could be in there watching TV or working out one minute and you'll be out on the tier in a fight for your life the next minute. It happened yeah, just I'm that fast. I'm sure a lot fast. of people died or got really injured because cops were lacking, didn't tell people in time where to like be like, yo, shut this pod down because they're wilder than they're not one. You know what Sometimes I'm they let them, they want them killing each other. Maybe they be like, watch this. I know these two don't get along with that. Yo, yeah. hit this button. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, man, sick puppies. So us as North Daniels, you know, all day our mattresses would be rolled up and we'd be sitting by the door. I mean, I get up and I work out. I watch my TV, but for the most part, whenever there was movement or activity on the tier, I would be posted up on my door ready just in case my door would open. Because a lot of times the COs would say it was a mistake, it wasn't a mistake. but wow. it wasn't a mistake. I told you. You know, they pop certain doors open for different reasons. I used to see them. I used to watch from myself. Wow, you said that. Channel chapter five, yo, the weapons. No, no warning shots. There's a lot of different places out there on the yards to bury weapons inside the buildings, up on the, like in the little rafters. We obviously know where they're at, under sinks or in the walls, buried. They they keister it, you know, to to move a weapon from one place to another. They'll put it in their anal cavity. Is is uh, how it's moved around. The anal I'm cavity. And this 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 this, this is sad. What prisoners have to go through if they didn't just they didn't do the crime, this wouldn't happen. But you have to lead to this bullshit. They keister it. The keister it is crazy. That just sounds wrong, right? Yeah. Never heard that word before. Never heard of that. They'll put it in their anal cavity. What? Is, is how it's moved around. Oh, uh poor. -huh. I don't know how you want to put that out there. But. So I went through through Cork and Shoe Wars um, back in the, the early 90s. We were going at it with the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood. You know, they knew we were mortal enemies, that we would kill each other if we had a chance. Wow. But they would put us out on the yard, and they knew. 
the administration knew over there. You'd have to have your light on, and that meant that you wanted to go to yard. Guys used to turn their lights off because they didn't want no part of it. Mm. But those of us that remained active, we turn our lights on and wow. we go out. It's like a little enclosure before you get out to the yard. And the yard's like a little, it's, it's kind of shaped like a piece of pie. When you get in that little enclosure, you can see through the yard door who you're gonna go out there and wow. get off with. So we go out, we fight, always try to get yourself situated so that they have their back to the gunner so that you can see what the gunner's doing because we were the ones that were getting targeted. It was the Northerners and the Blacks that were getting shot and killed over there. There's no warning shots per se, but what they have is they have like a, it's called a Bertha or a knee knocker. It's a, like a gas gun that fires little wooden blocks. What the hell? They have Sometimes guns on the yard ready to kill people? Like they're freaking birds and ducks? And I, I find it interesting that he would describe the shape of the yard as a pie, something he would eat. <laughs> he snacks. Yeah, how how would he know? How would the cops know who's a Serena, who's a Nortenia? They're both Mexican. Oh, they know. They just know about maybe, maybe it's a style. They move. The rat tail. Nah, let me stop. Maybe you never know. Yeah. It's a fire once, twice, and then they'll grab the 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 real gun. But yeah, they don't they don't give warning shots. Now the other thing though too is is the COs are making bets. They would be like, hey, I was just we, got, at. We, got, we got money on you guys, man. You guys better wow. be. Just, yo, and I was going to say that when he, when he pressed the button, but yo, I, I, I want to see this fight. Who you think will win? I got $50 on this person. I would, I would do that too. It's though. that gladiator. You would do that? Yeah. I'll bet on him. Wow. Go out there and do your thing, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes it would take their best fighters from one building and they would take an, the best fighter from another building and get them out there. Mm. When I first came in the system, I was Brown, young. Son. I used to mean mug them. I used to have a, a bad taste, you know, for certain individuals. And I, I didn't even know why I hated them. It was because I was supposed to. That's the mindset that was instilled wow. within me. But being around them, a lot of them were just like us. They were solid dudes. If there's a Sureño and he needs some toothpaste or I got a book and he wants to read it, you know, we'll pass literature back and forth to each wow. other. We can play chess on the tier. It doesn't do us any good to make that environment any more stressful Toxic, than right. what it is. Now, like I said, if the gates open, we were directed to basically torpedo out and engage with whoever was on the tier. Chapter six, the, the guards. Getting into relationships. If we were gonna take off on staff, the guards, our politics might get set aside for a bigger purpose um, to where, yeah, we might come together to go against the administration. You might see something like a small uprising within an ad say. How do you sign up for that there. job? That job might be worse than actually being a cop, right? I think correction officers- It's way worse. They say when you correction officer, you do the time with the prisoners because you're always there. I mean, I'll probably be a mad cool ass CEO. Yeah. I'll be mad cool. Like they'll fire me because I'll be cool, <laughs> man. Because I'll be trying to help people. And you know, and a cop, I couldn't be a cop. I mean, yeah. it's too dangerous, right. you know what I mean? But correction officers, at least you have like weapons, but nah, if it's a couple nah, of them boys. It's like you and like a hundred people when you're trying to control grown ass gangsters, yo. Like, yeah. You're not controlling them. Like bro. literally animals. Yeah. You're controlling it. Yeah, they, they will eat you alive, basically. It's a bunch of Draculas, bro. We're not getting fed right. They're tearing up ourselves and, and disrespecting, you know, personal possessions like pictures and things like that. Where everybody says, you know what, we had enough. Let's just all board up, blocking the, your window so that they can't see in there, which basically forces them to have to come in there and cell extract you. It's something that I, I was personally involved in before in Susanville. You know, when we were going through the cork and shoe wars, people might uh, debate this, but a lot of the COs were split as far as who they favored in that war. Even some of the female officers. It's just you could you could tell that they they uh they were either sympathizing for the north or they were sympathizing for the mm -hmm. south. A lot of it is just is geography. Where 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 that prison's at? Where they from? Whether or not they got family that are you know that might be hooked up. So it just depends. Corruption it's rampant in the county jails. I mean you see a lot of relationships that happen where. Female officers are getting into relationships with inmates. The next thing you know, they're bringing in wow. drugs. <laughs> they're not getting that kind of stuff into the visiting room. They're getting it through corrupt 
COs. Mm. In prison, one of the things that is a huge problem are the cell phones that are coming in. But it's a huge business for COs. They can make anywhere from a thousand dollars to four thousand bringing in a phone, phone, a cell phone. Having the phones is it's it's a lot different because again, you could be a six figure earner. Literally, yeah, you can make six figures off of just selling phones, cigarettes, work, phone. Wow, not like, cigarettes. I think they sell it right, vape pens and all that, e pens. Yeah, all that for sale. Trip, trip on the price. program back in the 90s. You had when we'd be back there plotting somebody's murder, there was a lot of lag time that was involved. Either it had to go out through a letter, a call, was letter, right now? a phone call, or a visit. And you know, you'd have to wait maybe a week or two for somebody to drive three, four hundred miles to come see you up in up in Pelican Bay. Mm. But now you put these cell phones in the hands of these leaders. If somebody's got a, a green light on them, they'll make a phone call. You'll get the a leader that will call a figurehead on the streets and will it will happen in real time. Hey, this dude's got a green light on him. He's gotta go. It might happen that same mm. night. Chapter seven, the codes. The codes. And a stack of language. Let's say somebody came on the tier. I was on the tier in the ad seg or something, and he was like six cells down. I make verbal contact with him. I yell down there, "Hey, homie, that just came in. Hey, yo, uh, once you get situated, go ahead and make a line so that you know I can get at you." Making a, a line is where you take the elastic from your boxers or from the strands from your sheet. You'll make a, a line. And you tie them together so that you can put a weight at the end of it. Yo. And then you you'll throw <laughs> you weight at the end of it. Word. And then you, you'll throw it down the tier. It's just like a way to get back and forth to the cells. So he'll tie the wow. kite on there and I'll pull it in and I'll read it. And then I'll respond to it and he'll pull it back. Ingenuity. There's a lot of different ways to uh, to do things like that. Covert communications. No, it definitely shows how a smart land- humans can be. Like once you're in these predicaments and like you start figuring out puzzles. Yeah. Like dudes, we, some dudes in Pennsylvania just escaped out the maximum prison. This shit had like three walls. Yeah, Philly. The sides of five stories high with barbed wire. Old boy climbed that shit, went down the side, scaled that shit, climbed the other wall, scaled it, climbed the other wall, scaled it. Humans are innovative, yeah. to say the least. Language that we use in there is called Nawa. It's an Aztec language and there's different dialects, but we use it so that if we're on a tier and we need to communicate and there's other officers on the, there's officers on the tier, we can talk on the tier in front of them and they're not going to know what we say. There's very few people that know the whole actual, the whole language. They'll, they'll just know certain yeah. words like weapon, drugs, CO, hit, green light, things like that. Northaniels, our color is red. Sureños, they wear blue. So the NF insignia, the sombrero, obviously it signifies the Mexican mm. heritage. You got the dagger that signifies that this is a violent organization. And then each drop of blood characterizes its own individual meaning. So one drop of blood is for blood in, guys that have spilled blood coming into wow. the organization, blood out, um, meaning anybody that tries to walk away from the organization it's an automatic death sentence. Wow. And then the third drop of blood is for members that have honorably spilled blood that have died in the course of, you know, their career. Wow. I, so if you try to leave, I know in the black gangs, you get a DP, you get beat up. If you try to leave the gang, you get beat up out of the gang. Yeah, you some, most games you get jumped in and you get jumped out. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess the NF don't play that shit, blood wow. in, blood out. I think that's actually a movie. Word. That dude on the back of my head and I got that covered up. I had a star on my hairline when I had hair. That signified the NR. I had Familiano over my left eyebrow, being a family member in Spanish. And then I had a tattoo on the back of my forearm. Um, I had an NF back there. Oh, the the money. Oh, shit. The money. Soup Serrano. Top railings. The whole purpose of generating money is supposed to be for the less fortunate members, you know, that are doing life in prison that don't have a means to take care of themselves. That's what it's supposed to be. It's a smokescreen, though. There's no trickle-down effect. There's a trickle-up effect. The money that comes in, it goes to the leadership, the select few at the top of the hierarchy, and they're the ones that, that use that money for their own expenses. You know, some of it's used to invest mm. in drugs and to invest in new... Uh, 
regiments or new territory that the end you know breaking nf ground out there on the streets if i got a visitor that's willing to bring in drugs off the top my gang is gonna require whatever 25 percent of it 50 percent of it or i might even have to turn turn it all over to them and they'll give me back what you know they feel that they want to give me you know you're part of that gang you're going to take care of that gang or or that criminal organization the biggest thing in, in prison County jails, the biggest, the currency in there is soups. Everybody loves soups, top ramens. That's like a prison or jail currency right there. But you know, obviously then you got weed, tobacco, then the hardcore drugs and things like that. White Lightning, you know, like a cup of that, it can go for like $50, but you're talking about like a cup of something that's like vodka. $50 vodka. It's gotta be a lot more since he recorded this. Be my buffer. I learned early on from a young gang member that the more violent I was, the more blood that I spilled out there on the streets, the more respect I got. The fastest way to elevate yourself within the organization is by hurting people. So out on the streets, the, the, the structure, you know, you have your regimental commander, second in command, your squad leaders, and then your, your manpower. You know, I would have a second in command and he would be my buffer. He would collect the money. He would make sure that everybody's following policy, you know, issuing out the drugs, the guns that were coming in off the streets. That was to kind of keep me uh, insulated. In the 90s, when it was a lot different, the regiments were called colonias back in those days. Everything was compartmentalized. You had a robbery crew, another crew that would sell dope. You had a, a wrecking crew. I think the influence has waned over the years, like a lot. In the In the 80s, in the 90s, you couldn't, testify against the NF and, and live in the same county. You wouldn't even want to be in California. The The threat was, it was very real back in those days. But once the three strike law came that into effect, we kind of stepped away from the violent crimes and started doing almost exclusively. Now I understand when drugs. they put that law in place, man, because Cali's no joke. Like we, we covered a lot of Cali documentaries where people are killing each other out here. It's different, man. Like, they had to put that law. Yeah, got to like, slow it down. Three strikes. And that's that's too many chances, man. It should be one and a half, two. Maybe two. Three? You had three times to fuck up. But that's like after 30 years. I think about it. Because if you do three violent crimes, so you probably going to have to do that every 15 years. If you get... Lionel Richie had a song back in the day. It's once, twice, <laughs> three times a lady. <laughs> there. People know that they're out there. They're in the cuts. They're functioning. It's just not as, as it's not like it was. The truth. I want to say since like 68 is when the NF first came into inception. From that time on, that's when they took a stand against the Mexican mafia in South Block, San Quentin. Mm. This is basically when the NF banded together, decided that they weren't going to be abused by the Mexican Mafia anymore. And from that point on, that's when the war started. So for almost the next five decades, what? that war was in effect. The truce actually started back in the in the shoe program in Pelican Bay, the end of uh, hostilities, their agreement. Again, the whole purpose of it was mm. for a lot of these guys wow. that had been in the shoe program for some of them three decades, it was to get back out to the main lines and to basically show CDC that they could, you know, live on the same yard without killing each other. So I thought it was a temporary thing. It was going to, they were going to get out there. Somebody was going to push a line somewhere and it was going to kick off. And then it was just going to be a domino effect, but it's lasted. I mean, honestly, I never thought in my lifetime that I would ever see the day when North Daniels and Sureños would be out there on the same yards playing basketball with each other, wow. walking laps with each other. But at the same time, there was a lot of house cleaning. Guys that had issues, internal issues within their respective gang mm-hmm. were getting dealt with. Yeah. Whether it was over misconduct, um, something came up in their past or something like that, there was a lot of house cleaning. And then there was a lot of guys that didn't agree with with the peace treaty. They felt like, you know what? I didn't sign up for this, man. Um, you know, what, what are we doing? What about all the brothers that that have spilled blood in the past? I think the violence is worse. When they let these guys out of the shoe program, all these leaders, guys that are from the 70s, from the 80s, when I came to prison, 
they're starting to bring the old school back where they're not just poking people and slicing people up no more. You see all the murders that are happening out there. You know, the Mexican mafia, the NF, they're behind it. They would rather eat their own right now, stab some of their own people. I mean, it's crazy. The politics that are going on right now, everything's going backwards. Oh, shit. The fallout, chapter 11, trying to spare me. I like how you don't hear the question. In 2004, I was arrested in a multi-agency investigation where I was the leader of a of a street crew, an NF regiment. So I was the main target in that investigation. On the first day, on June 11th, 2004, they raided around eight houses that were all in relation to this investigation. On the first wave, they hit my uh, house where I had all my guns. They hit another house where I had all my money. By 2005, that case continued to snowball. They put me in an observation cell because they said I had too much influence with the North Daniels. Wow. So they wanted to keep me isolated. And during, you know, during that time, my whole concern was, you know, my girl, she had lupus. I was trying to do everything I could to make it easy on her. I knew I was in trouble, but I didn't want to tell her because she had lupus and for somebody like that, stress is a killer. So mm. during the first couple of weeks, talking to her and my mom on the phone, I had some difficult conversations with them. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to sacrifice yourself, you know, think about your family for once. You know, my mom kept pushing no me way. to cooperate. She kept don't pushing me. Don't tell me he cooperated because his case make it seem like he cooperated. I don't know. Because the way he said it, that was a lot of, he was a gang leader and he's out right now. But that was from 2004, so you could have done 20 years or like 18 years, you know? Let's see. We're going to find out. Cooperate. You need to cooperate. Oh, do shit. what you do. Your wife's He's out here rat. dying. What are you going to do? And I basically started pacifying her, telling her whatever I needed to tell her. Let the case play out. It's, it's, I haven't even been to court yet. So what they do is, and understandably, they release my phone calls of how I've been talking to my girl. And all my co-defendants hear these conversations, oh, you know, about cooperating, trying to explain that. To the NF, um, Yo, it was gonna fall on deaf ears because of who I was. So, if, it's, if you like what you see, please subscribe to the channel. Let's not forget that we need your subscri sub subscription and we need you to share this. But it looks like maybe Boxer told. Yeah, yeah right. Kind of lining us up to tell us that he had to tell. Was I was a leader? I get held to different standards because I know better, and I got no business talking like that. This is five years later now. People are still speculating that I'm cooperating. Come on, man, it's five years and there's no police reports, there's nothing. Wow. So somebody that had an agenda pushed the issue with leadership up in the Bay, they put a green light on me. Wow. Nothing happened. It was literally the dude that tried to, honoring the green light, tried to push a phone over in front of me on the tier. I still held my mud. I still want, wanted to be a part of the, of the organization. 17 months later, they put me back on the active tier. I functioned for another two years, put another green light on me. And the second time wasn't, it was just as bad as the first time. Somebody wanted to act like they were trying to spear me through the bars. Mm. The spear was like two feet, too short, didn't have a tip on it. You know, my wife, she died. She ended up oh, dying. Shit. My mom ended up dying. She passed wow. away. So they did this at a time when I was already in a dark place, you know what I mean? I'm looking at life. I was getting ready to plead out, but then they, they pulled that. So I was like, you know what? I'm done, man. The district attorney wants to wash me up. You know, I'm in bad standings now with, with the NF. What do I do? Law enforcement again came up and they're like, you know what? Loyalty only goes so far. Come on, man. I agreed that I was done and that, um, you know, that I would talk to him. Yo! So that's what I did. he's on a... He, so he doesn't live in California the way he's explaining it because he was nah, like... he lives in Mesa, Mesa, Arizona. Not even, bro. He might live on the East Coast, bro. You gotta leave the coast. If you're still... He, if he's still on the same coast, he's bugging. He's a rat. He's crazy. Yeah, hey, he gotta survive now. Come on now. He's a big rat, right? Yeah. <laughs> a and large that, one. Um, you know, that I would talk to him. So that's what I did from that oh, point shit. on. I, I denounced my membership. Oh, wow. Started and, to sing. You know, I agreed to cooperate. Oh. <laughs> However, the cooperation that I gave was just, I didn't go in as a percipient witness. Everybody that I got arrested with was gone. So I went in there basically talking about what I'm talking about now, how gangs work. The judge struck two of my strike priors 
which took me out of the three strikes and gave me 16 years, eight months. I've been in the county jail almost 10 years. None of that had to happen. If the NF would have let me fight my case, I would have been a big dummy sitting in Pelican Bay right now with a life sentence. Yeah, I was one of the true believers. But, you know, by them pulling wow. the trigger twice, I feel I felt betrayed. Bad standing. He's a rat. On the run. Catch, catch by the You know this shit got like 9 million views, 5 million views, right? Burr? Millions of people saw this. Wow. So I know his, I, I mean, he's kind of an older dude, so a lot of his he don't care. peers are... He don't care. He ain't scared of nobody, man. Word. He been through a lot, that dude right there. Respect, boxer. For Burr. somebody that that just doesn't okay. want to be part of the organization yeah. no more. For them to walk away, to just ride off into the sunset and go on about their life and not hurt nobody, it's still not considered honorable, but it's it's something that people will will say, you know what, at least he didn't he didn't tell on everybody. At least he didn't hurt nobody. But you know, there there's no there's never a retirement. You'll never be able to walk away in good standings. I've had a couple of situations where I ran into some individuals when there's 15 of them, that's when everybody wants to get active. Oh, shit. But, you know, sure. when I catch cats by themselves, they're not trying yeah, to do all that, fun. you know. And then I'm not I'm not trying to look for trouble either, you know. I'm trying to just live, uh, um, live out the rest of my days without all the drama. I'm, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder. The backstory. Robberies, home invasions. I grew up in San Francisco, oh, um, shit. He from California. Bay. My mom was a, a young heroin addict. She got involved with drugs at a young age. Wow. At the age of 11, I found my way back to my mom's from foster care. You know, I found out she was using, and it, she didn't just give it to me. You know, you know, people are gonna be like, what kind of mother gives her 12 year old child um, heroin? I understand that, but I don't blame her. You know, I, I look at it as she was, stuck in her addiction at a young age she got stuck in that cycle and i kind of manipulated the situation i told her i knew what she was doing and if she didn't give it to me i was going to go get it in the streets and Wait, from what? that point on for the next 40 years that <laughs> tore my life up in every um way possible from relationships to the things the choices i would make uh me becoming involved in the criminal element. Um, How do you even survive then, that long with heroin? Like, yeah, because it usually dis just destroys all your tissue, your body, your uh -huh. muscle. Maybe he wasn't doing it in jail. Maybe. Well, maybe that's why he gained that weight, too, because he's more healthy now. He's off of it. You know what I'm saying? He's not healthy, bro. He's huge. Yeah, but he got meat on him, though. Hey, I yo. stopped going to school. <laughs> I started drinking. That's when I started getting involved with gangs. Gang. It started with <laughs> burglarizing cars, ripping out the, you know, the radios, the, the speakers, oh, wow. selling them for drugs, robberies, home invasions, and then we started using weapons and it just continued to escalate. From that time, it didn't take me long before I got caught up in the juvenile justice system. I caught uh, four robberies, wow. one out of San Francisco and, and two out of San Mateo. I took seven years, ran consecutive, and they sent me to prison. What story? Finish your story, bro. How many years he did overall? My book is, I've met, you know, through through talking to at-risk youth, I've talked to, to kids that um, have gotten in trouble. Probation officers come up and tell me that, you know, you, these youngsters, they read your book and we actually use your book as type of, like a workshop type of thing. The name of the book is called Nuestra Familia, Broken Paradigm. And so I started doing a YouTube channel, Paradigm Media News. I got a, a series on my channel. Oh, sure. One's called Inner Demons. They look different. The other one's yeah. called War Stories. It's also therapeutical to talk about it, you know, to try to help some of these youngsters that might be um, headed for that type of lifestyle. I give them the fine print that you, they, they don't hear about until it's too late, until they make a commitment and they find themselves in that situation. Yeah. I've seen a lot of my homeboys uh, die throughout the years. Most of them are gone. Two stories. There's only three roads you're going to travel in this lifestyle. You're either going to spend the rest of your life in prison. You're going to die um, trying to push the organization's advancement forward. Or you're going to turn your back. You know, there's no there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's no and complaints to the FBR. Gladiator fights. Wow. 
Wow, they gotta quit it. Gladiator fights, they're fucking... Wow. wow. So what does this have to do with this guy? They're just covering over all the yeah. corrupt cops. They don't use no voices on this video. <laughs> Uh, I don't care no more. Yo, so it's Jerry TV. If you have your Scott channel, thanks for tuning in. We, we out of here. Peace. And I know how I get, so I got still low and I move my knock. I don't trust no nigga, I don't trust no man. Ain't no friends, everybody get shot. You never know how nigga gon' throw. I'm hitting the flow with a couple of shots. You better move, you better duck either way to the go. You get got.